coming to our second session of our course on faith, science, and physics. Last time I have tried to outline the development of the historical faith of animism, fetishism, polytheism, and monotheism. It was in 19th century when our, historical, our historicism evaluated or re-evaluated the whole history of humanity. So, under the influence of Charles Darwin, historical investigation penetrated all other fields of human activity. So it was for the first time when we looked into our past. The man I mentioned here was Auguste Comte, a French mathematician who gave us this historical development from animism, fetishism, polytheism, monotheism. How each of our faith developed historically and superseded the previous one qualitatively richer. So monotheism is the last link. After that came challenge of human reason in the form of science. Uh, today I am going to talk about this miraculous development of Greek culture. No other culture or civilization developed something similar to Greeks. It was uh, around 6th century BC. And it developed in two regions, not in Greece as such, in Asia Minor and in southern Italy, which indicates that the religious myth of polytheism was very strong in mainland Greece. And this very faith would not permit any resistance. The resistance came in colonies. Asia Minor, today is Turkey, and southern Italy. The man who plays a very important role here is Xenophanes. Xenophanes was an early thinker among pre-Socratics who looked at his tradition around him <coughs> and became very critical. He noticed that in all polytheistic religions that there is an element of human creation. It was he who said, if horses create their own horse or own god, the god would be a big horse. <laughs> and all other animals will create a big God and goddesses according to their own image. This was the idea which we call in science anthropomorphism. Anthropos, man in Greek, morphine to create, to shape. Man shaped ideas, hypostasized thrown out and found there. So this is the method which was outlined by Xenophanes. It is remarkable that in history of mankind, Xenophanes was buried in Greek tradition and not emphasized. When mentioned, then he did it in reference to Greek polytheism. 
But if you look into the idea of Xenophon, it is a universal finding about human race, about human thinking, about man's working of his reason. He discovered something universal. Anthropomorphism, hypostatization. Applied after his look at polytheism of Greece, applicable to everything, including everything what will follow, including science and wisdom. Everything is man-made. It is difficult to escape from the implications of these findings of Xenophanes. As I mentioned before, it was not apparent to most of the people who followed. It is not clear still today. Xenophanes is very seldom mentioned, even as the most important one among the Socrates. So this is the beginning of the criticism of Greek polytheism. I have mentioned before that there are two centers in 6th century BC. And uh, let me mention one more thing. Up to this time, Greeks did not have writing system. What Greeks had was oral tradition. <clears throat> Homer's Iliad and Odyssey was orally narrated by Arab souls who were traveling in Greece and narrated what is known as Odyssey and Iliad. You can imagine, or it is probably difficult to imagine, if you live in a nation which doesn't have a written tradition, where you depend only on words you hear. So this is the situation before the advent of pre-Socratics. Greek writing was in making developed out of Phoenician writings. We can imagine how many people in the nation were able to know how to read, how to write. Difficult to say. Few percent. And it was difficult to distribute it among other people. It means the other people depended on oral tradition. when the elite of Greek thinkers, then they appeared in striving cities. On, on the coast of Asia Minor, it was Miletus, M-I-L-E-T-U-S, Miletus, striving city, which traded goods, and ideas. It was in Miletus that became kind of mecca of Presocratics. Striving seaport in which three leading thinkers arose out of nowhere. It was Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes.
all of them in, within the city of Miletus. These were the first, we could call them, philosopher scientists. Thales explained nature in form of nature. Nature had a soul, just like magnet has a soul. And that soul was coming from water. He explained that Thales saw in front of him a lot of water. Water was coming from above. During the winter it froze and was in form of ice. So water was all around him. Instead of talking about <coughs> personalities in nature, he talked in terms of nature, explaining nature by a natural element of water. Water became wind. Wind was changed with rain in water. Water was everywhere. So it was a generalization of reason based on observation that the basis of everything has to be water. Hand in hand with that, we must have become aware that there is something within himself which made it possible to arrive at this conclusion. That it was something within himself what was reason. There are amazing things which this man produced. He is the first Greek who we know traveled to Egypt. When he was in Egypt, he learned many findings. I'm sorry, which, which one of these three are you referring Tate. to? Tate. Tate was the first who traveled to Egypt, where he became acquainted with geometry. And it was in Egypt when he, we are told, invented a way how to measure the height of the pyramid. Usually you measure any height by using a short yardstick and go and measure the yardstick and multiply the lengths of the short stick. But Thales had a great idea. There must be a rational way how to measure the height of the pyramid without ever climbing on it. He got a great idea in form of a shade shadow, his own shadow. When he walked in Egypt, he noticed that he was followed by his own shade. And the shade was sometimes long, sometimes shorter, sometimes non-existent. You know, and here is the walk of his mind. There is a moment when my shade is exactly the same as my height. It happens around the noon. When the sun is just above me, no shade. 
So let's wait maybe until one o'clock. This is the moment when my shade is exactly as my height. Now I have a yardstick. I go to the pyramid and measure the shade of the pyramid and multiply it by my shade. This is a great idea. Is it clear to you how simple it was? It was working of his mind. The moment when the shade is equivalent to my height, all things are throwing the same shade, which are can be measured in terms of their own eye. Universal finding. And how to explain it to somebody else? I think if he had explained it to others, as I had tried to explain it to him, it should be understandable. You can ask the question, where does it come from? Where does this invention come from? From a human mind. And this is the basis of a new man. Man who thinks, who observes, generalizes observations. He learned to, how to make deductions from universals. He discovered that universals were geometrical findings. This is what he discovered in, in Egypt. But what he also discovered was that everything was empirical in Egypt. Geometry was geometry measuring of the earth. What human mind lifts out of this measuring is a completely new condition of working with ideas. And this working with ideas was Greek discovery. After him, Thales. There was another great visitor, Pythagoras. He was overwhelmed with empirical findings of Greek geometry, which was caused by River Nile, by floods of River Nile. When the great water subsided, the owners wanted to have their plot back. <coughs> so they received it as their plots existed before the floods. This was geometry. And there were various geometrical figures which Egyptians knew how to handle. There were practical geometers. Thales and Pythagoras went back to Greece. There was no river Nile what they brought with themselves was just findings on piece of papyrus, triangles, rectangles, and they represented in their mind abstraction abstracted from Greek, from Egyptian fields. Greeks in their hilly country did not have anything else. So those who returned from Egypt discovered a new world of the mind. A 
triangle. Where, where is the triangle? I project the triangle. Later on, there must be some prototype of the triangle. It must be in the realm of all things which exist somewhere out there. Abstraction derived from earth, from river Nile, into human mind and projected into existence. This is the leap into mathematics. This is the greatest difficulty in our schools still nowadays. To explain to our students what are mathematical things. They are abstractions. <coughs> Lifted from reality, physical reality, observable reality, abstracted, projected into world of abstraction, about which we ask questions. This very leap is very difficult to explain. Therefore, our young generation, measured by world yardsticks, <coughs> is number 28 in the world. Our advanced civilization produces school system which cannot explain these basic abstractions. Our students hate it, try to avoid it. The rest of the world is far more advanced and far more successful in delivering of these mathematical abstractions. So this example. So when uh, Thales and Pythagoras brought geometry back to Greece, did they still not have written a written language? Was it still just orally? Although I know you can sketch out yeah. geometric figures, but yes, you didn't. It was uh, transformed into Greek language, uh -huh. Greek way of thinking. Uh, Egyptians themselves would not understand this leap of Pythagoras. You know, had he come back and try to teach about abstractions, they, I doubt they would be able to understand. This was not their type of tea. No, I guess what I'm asking is, did he have the ability to, to um, write out like the descriptions of thesis, or was it just in his mind and, and the maybe sketches of Yeah, figures? he had... Just he, in his mind? In his mind. Okay. You know, and he was surrounded by very few people who understood mm -hmm. what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. There were very few people. Pythagoras <laughs> lived on the <coughs> island Samos, to the north from Miletus, in Mediterranean Sea, on today's uh, across from Turkey. And when he was organizing his little group of Pythagoreans. There was a tyrant, a ruler in Samos, who became suspicious that there is a group who is talking about something he did not understand. He drove Pythagoras and his group out of Samos and Pythagoras escaped to southern Italy with his group, where he settled down with a semi-religious mathematical group. Nobody around their community understood what these people were talking about. They became suspicious. 
there were other things, Pythagoreans, uh, Pythagoreans did not, did not like beans. Southern Italians lived out of beans. <laughs> you know, they had their reason why <laughs> Pythagorean had forbidden any member of, of the religious Pythagorean group to eat beans. You said, though, that they didn't have written language yet. No. So how do we know all this stuff if they weren't able to record it yet? Yeah, there were remnants, there were statements which they made later record, later. Okay, but still at this point there's no still, written Greek language. No, there were, we don't have anything from, from Pisocrates, okay. only statements which were recorded later. And we are trying to reconstruct from few statements, you know, mm -hmm. from the, the foot of an elephant. We are trying to, to establish the whole elephant, how he walked on four feet, but he have only one foot. So, this is a reconstruction, a credible reconstruction. But uh, in defense of uh, pre-literate peoples, there's... Uh, stories about anthropologists have found that um, people without writing had developed tremendous powers of memory. The Incas, well, they had AIDS with the string, but yes. the uh, Hawaiians also had no uh, written record before contact. But they had these memory banks that could record ge genealogies going back centuries. You know, they, they developed, really developed their minds to remember things. But what is it in the memory when you have a... I admire your great memory. Now you will entertain me and telling me stories that I will be seeing. Uh, you know, swallowing everything what you say. <laughs> what about yeah. if I have a little critical mind? If I listen to your memory? <laughs> you know, I can, he's pulling my leg. <laughs> Especially about the beans. <laughs> <laughs> It depends on the receiver. Uh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, and the subject. Yeah, but if, if yeah. I think it's important to note that even in forensic science, they know that everybody's memory is different. Yeah. And okay. the same story comes out in different ways every single time. True. So it is an unknown world, you know, in these oral traditions. And what we have a first breakthrough, Thales measuring of the pyramid became a feat. People around him could not forget, so they were trained. It was all tradition. You know, he measures the pyramid without climbing on it. Amazing, amazing. He was also man. Thales was the man who predicted solar eclipse. Mm -hmm. First prediction of solar eclipse. And solstices. He knew how to inscribe uh, a triangle uh, uh, into a circle. Right angle triangle into a circle. So all of these things survived as amazing feats of, of tales. He divided year into four seasons, and year had 365 days. He used deductive process of reasoning later, 200 years later, formally expressed by Aristotle. He outlined that if you have a universal truth, you can deduce from this universal truth down to the particulars, everything, what is deducible from the universal truth. 
So this is the beginning of the deductive process of logic. So, but another thing is what amazing things. He declared the Earth to be round. How he figured out that? This amazing process. In Miletus in the harbor, he saw ships which were approaching the harbor. What he saw that a ship in the, at a distance, he doesn't see the ship. He sees just the mass. At a distance, it looks like <coughs> a ship is coming. Then people explain that the ship grows when it comes close. <laughs> <laughs> he did not believe that. The ship shows at first the mast, and in order to show the mast, it does not travel on something what is empirical straight line, the sea. The sea must be bent. So here is Miletus, and here is a ship. So you can't see it. Hmm? You can't see the drawing. Hmm. Can you find a pen that, that, that draws stronger line? Hmm. <laughs> So this is the coast, coast of Asia Minor. Thales stands in front of him is the sea. He observes a boat. He doesn't observe a boat. He observes a mast, the top of the mast. And the closer the ship later on, he discovered it was a ship. In front of him, all of a sudden, is a ship. But before he observed the boat, it was only upper part, part of the mass of the boat. So he figures out when I see the mast, when I imagine I am observer here. And there is another boat. I see from this point, not the boat, but the upper part of the mass. And if I transfer myself as observer here and see another boat, I see the mass, and the boat comes here. So this is very process similar to that of measuring the height of the pyramid. You know, it's a projection of human mind <clears throat> in such a way that he has a purpose to explain why he sees the upper part of the mast and, and the boat grows, grows until it comes into the harbor. He goes and announces in Miletus, the earth is round. By these two, three projections of postulated observer, he makes a conclusion. I was showing it in my graph, you know, continuing. <laughs> continuing. <laughs> So, I mean, indeed. So he was doing mental experiments before Einstein. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, this is discovery of human mind and universe of ideas of human mind. So this was father of new enterprise of philosophy. So. 
I mentioned already, he already lay down four seasons in the year, the year 365 days. Everything is water. Water is the element where everything starts and returns. Later in the 19th century, it was discovered that the human body consists of about 92% of water. Davis was pretty close. <laughs> so this is a new enterprise. He produced followers. Anaximander, Anaximander was one of his leading uh, promoters. And what emerges here, that when you pr produce some follower, the follower, in, instead of repeating what he learned from the teacher, wants to climb over the teacher. He disagrees with the teacher in order to stand firm. I have my own idea. So Anaximander disagrees with his teacher in order to establish himself, you know, as a equal. So this is a principle of also, which became principle of science. For him, Earth hangs in the middle of the sky, balanced by other planets. <clears throat> the world consists of unlimited elements. Each heavenly body is surrounded by other bodies. Animals came to be from vapors raised by sun. And man came into being from other animals, mostly from fish. So he added, you know, to teaching of tennis, origin of animals, origin of man. On basis of his observation, he wanted to extend the teaching of his great master, Teres. So this was Anaximander. Then third one, Anaximenes also tried to establish himself, and he didn't want to go along with Teres or Anaximander. He wanted to be his own, he said. Everything depends on air. Air is it which we breathe. Soul needs air. It is air, breath, the first principle. Air is wind. Air is cloud, water, mud, earth. It is the final thing, air. Without air, nothing happens. So now you have in the air already somebody who observes and says, my God, these fellows, they have new ideas, you know, they don't talk about gods, you know, and they talk about water and, and air and how things happen. It's exciting. <clears throat> so this is Anaximenes who adds air. There is another one, a great man. Heraclitus. Heraclitus. He says in Greek, Panta Rei. Everything moves. Every, everything flows. Nothing abides. The world in flux. You cannot step into the same river twice. Because the river 
changes is other river, a new change. So change in change. You can never step into the same river twice. Concept of change. The whole world is in a constant flux. Cold things change into warm, warm things into cold. The war is the condition of our world. Strife is ultimate justice. If it should disappear, all things would cease to exist. So, this is the Panta rage. Everything is in flux. So we never stand still. You are thinking you are sitting, but you are running. Everybody is growing older. You never step into the same river twice. It was a disturbing idea. You know, to live in flux. You can never take a rest. You can never take a nap. And rest. We are bound to learn. All of us are in constant flux. Panta way. disturbing ideas. Those who were communicating these new ideas between Milet and Samos, Pythagoreans in Samos, and in southern Italy, these ideas were brought by sailors. And they said, what's new? Have you heard about Heraclitus? He says that you can never take, take a rest. You are moving. You cannot escape the fate of constant change. My God, in, in southern Italy, you know, there were in the meantime Greeks who learned about Pythagoras. And it was a famous Eleatic school. This Eleatic school consisted of men like Parmenides, who was the father of the school. Parmenides, he produced uh, a famous pupil, Zeno. Zeno, Zeno, and they came up with completely new concept. The reality is unchanging. Contradiction to Heracle, who said there is constant change. They said there is no change. We are suspended. The being is stacked. Being one, unchanging one, is ultimate reality of one and many things. Does alternate ultimate reality change becomes the basic question. Or remain always the same is the ultimate reality of the world we live in, described by Heraclit <coughs> or by Parmenides. Are we in constant change or are we repose, suspended in nothing, unable to do anything? 
frozen, sentence to be frozen as one being. Zeno became the militant defender of Parmenides. He is famous with his paradox, in which he explains that the fastest of all Greeks, Achilles, can never overrun a tortoise. So there is his famous race, Achilles and Tortoise. Well, Achilles is a gentleman. <coughs> What's the second name? Achilles. No, not Achilles. What's the second name? Uh, tortoise. Tortoise. Oh. Tortoise. Here <laughs> <laughs> <Karen> the tortoise. <coughs> Tor tortoise. Tor tortoise. Yeah. I was from Tortoise. So, Achilles is a gentleman. He says, Tortoise, go a step ahead of the slow animal. So, Tortoise moves ahead, and then comes somebody with a pistol, and they start running. Now the rule of the game is, Achilles, in, in order to catch up with Tortoise, he has to come where Tortoise was. In the meantime, Tortoise goes ahead. Then Achilles has to reach where Tortoise was. Tortoise moves ahead of him. And Achilles reaches where Tortoise was before. Concluding, Achilles can never overtake Tortoise. <laughs> there is no motion. This is a proof, rational proof. You, you understand, if you establish that Achilles has to reach the point where Tortoise was, and Tortoise moves, and he has to move again, so there is no relative motion. There is a rational condition superimposed for the rest. Poor Achilles has no chance to overtake <laughs> Definitely the field of Heraclitus. So this was Zeno, the famous producer of the paradox. Another one was Melissus, who was not as distinguished, but he also produced arguments against Heraclitus. So you see the tension within the new school of scientist philosophers. Is universe static or dynamic? And each of these produces a firm position. One disagrees with the other one. Now it is up to you to embrace one of them, whichever suits you better. <coughs> but that's not all. There is another man who arrives at the scene. It is Empedocles. Empedocles. He looks back and his predecessors, and he says, you know, Thales gave us war, <coughs> Anaximenes, air, Heraclitus, fire, fire is a symbol of flux, flame, and earth. There are four elements which were used by predecessors. I put all of them together synthetically, I say, 
the reality consists of four elements of water, air, fire and earth. These are roots of things. Strife and love is responsible for not connecting these elements to hold together. Strive and love. This is the beginning of evolution of living forms. So they invented these ideas out of nothing. Just given problem by predecessors. They were free to follow predecessors or add something to it. So there is a synthetic war. There are four elements. These four elements will become a new explanation of nature. <coughs> but that's not all. The new science philosophy enterprise is here and doing very well. Another, another man, Anna Xar Govaras. This is 6th century BC, all of them. And, and Aksankoras looks at the teaching of all predecessors and postulates concept of mind. Nous in Greek. Nous. It is the mind which is responsible for all motion and for all becoming what we call reality. It is the mind of the universe which separates things, produces distinct world and distinct objects of all of reality. It is the hidden cause which maneuvers what will happen out of things. So it is the rational element governing the nature. And now come the last big group called atomists. Lukipos, Lukipos, and uh, what is Democritus. Hmm? Democritus. Democritus. Lukipos and Democritus. Lukop Lukipos is father of this atomic school. Atomists look at the nature or mental nature as presented by pre-Socratics. This is the nature of reality and their conflicts, how one disagrees with the other one. And they conceive a new concept. All things in the universe consist of atoms. Atom is uncut. Translated for me. Uncut. Uncutable. Undividable. In other words, atom is something that cannot be cut anymore. You can keep cutting things until you cut yourself into your fingers because you cannot hold the piece. <coughs> so, the world consists of uncutable. This is one of the great confusions of the Western mind. 
atoms are concepts, uncuttable. Now you have to conceive that there are the smallest elements which cannot be divided anymore. Uncut process of cutting until you arrive at something what cannot be cut anymore. That's the basic element of this one. Six century BC. Of course, there were no gods responsible for fusing these atoms together. They whirled and bounced into each other, you know, and said, Oh, let's go, let's dance, you know, for a while. And I have enough of you, I will dance with somebody else. So there was an element of, of internal fight between atoms and temporary unification, separation of atoms. And they come together by rational necessity. Everything moves in full and void. It is a logical development of Greek atheism. There is nothing but these atoms. There is no higher power which creates them. It is a world of mutual fighting. Atomistic philosophy was not popular among people. They could not stomach it. It was too radical, materialistic, atheistic. Even all other uh, pre-Socratics did not introduce any God into it. When they introduced the mind, mind is a constructive element in everything. But as you see, here are the basic constituencies of rational search answering our question what is the world we live in? What is the purpose of this world we live in? Where from? Where to? The universe and I in this universe. So they laid down the basic questions for posterity. No other culture and civilization produced something similar to what pre-Socratics were. Pre-Socratics laid down the foundation of a new tradition. And this new tradition won't survive very long. It will reach a peak in Socrates. And development of human society depends on other elements than only thinking. By development of reality, of political fighting. Greeks were attacked by Persians. This very Persian attack on Greece is one of the most important elements in development of Western culture and civilization. Greeks assumed the role of battle for the mysterious West, which will be emerging later on. They made a stand against Persian Empire. Persians were the most powerful nation in the Mediterranean world and in the world of Middle East. Their ambition was to conquer Greece. 
it looked like Greece had no chance. Greece was never very, very well organized militarily. It was known in constant strife among various groups of Greek nation, notably between Spartan and Athenians. Greece had their inhabitants in southern Italy and in today's Turkey. But it looks like it was a new element of becoming a Greek. Greek who has to stand up and fight Persians. Out of this historical battle, New Greece. Many Greeks from southern Italy and Sicily came to help in the fight. It uni unified Greece and Greece made a stand. The decisive stand was in Marathon, about 20 miles to the north from Athens where uh, Greeks defeated victorious armies of Persians. The second was the na a naval battle in Salamis. When I traveled to Greece, I traveled on a bus, and all of a sudden, the bus stopped and the driver tells us, we are just above Salamis. Most of the people say, what is Salamis? Salam, Salamis? No, no, Salamis. Is it Greek word for Salam? No, no. Most of the people are confused. No? I look down from down into the bay and I see about a hundred ships in the bay. There were ships of Onassis during the oil crisis. Ships of Onassis, who at that time was husband of our former Jackie Kennedy. Jackie Kennedy. During the oil crisis, all the ships were rotting away there. And I was told, just above the hotel is a place where Xerxes stood and observed his battle, uh, major preoccupation of myself 40 to 30, 40 years ago. After all this time, I was returning almost every year back to it, but I did not find audience, you know, because these were old folks' ways. <laughs> and so I am fortunate that I found enough people who are willing to listen to it. And, and who I hope some of you are convinced that it might be the case. I just no. I, I just, it just struck me that uh, in many ways folk art of every kind is a sort of a synthetic a priori in this sense of folk, a folk song, um, a drawing, you know those those flowers um, that are on the on the Czech pottery or the Spanish pottery. They, they seem to sort of be repeating themselves, very much like the proverbs. Yeah, it must, it must be the case. It must, it must apply to other yeah, arts, in, art forms. In all artistic forms. Unity in the arts. There's a cross-culture too. But in our verbal communication, using signs with meaning, in 
saying a proverb. We are announcing a meanings, meaning of science, understandable to audience which is familiar with this particular science. In, in uh, Czech, we, uh, it occurred to me, Ranin Tarce Dardo Scarce, early bird makes his father than bird which awakes to it. But you know, it is also Ragni Ptace Dalto Scarce in, in Czech language. So it is poetic expression of this early bird brings it farther than somebody who does not get up so early. So there is an attempt to express it poetically. And my grandmother was a great master of it, you know. She spoke poetically about everything, you know. It drove us crazy, you know. We heard it very often, you know. And the rhythm, it was poetic rhythm. You know, where did she learn that? It was a precondition of conveying proverb. And she enjoyed it. She didn't learn it in school. <coughs> from whom did she learn it? From her mother, from her father. Now, we don't know the sources, you know. We don't have 101 proverbs, you know. 101 English proverbs, you know, or Irish proverbs. Irish are great in proverbs, though. So. Dr. Seal writes about all nations, about all proverbs he was able to con collect. Yeah, please. I, I, I think that's a good comment because it relates to other arts in general. I mean, the arts, uh, I mean, art, art that endures, whether it's um, poems, proverbs, music, yeah. folk songs, they have a uh, universal appeal, even if you don't understand the immediate context, even if you don't understand the language in the piece of music or, or folk songs, you may not understand the music, but you can appreciate the musicality of the tunes and the emotions behind it. Musicality is yeah. synthetic a priori, that you can understand. Right. And some music, like Bach's music, mm -hmm. you know, overwhelmingly Bach's music, appears to nations of yeah. all over the world. And same with some African songs. Yeah. The language is totally unintelligible. Yeah. You can appreciate the musicality of yeah. the song, the emotions. You know, talking about music, when I was in Beijing, I went to a Chinese opera. I could not take it. I realize I'm coming from a different world. <laughs> there, it was not synthetic a priori. Uh -huh. I did not and I admit it to my Chinese friends. <coughs> they well, were amazed that I didn't understand. But interestingly, the first few times I heard it, to me it was just noise. Yeah. But it, I learned to appreciate it. Noise I don't understand. Yeah. It is noise. Yeah. But, but once you understand it, then you can appreciate it, that, and the emotions yeah. behind it. And even if, again, if, even if you don't understand the language, yeah. and, uh, and the thing about opera is you don't have to understand the text. You can just appreciate the uh, musicality, the theatrical, the drama. There's so much, so many levels. And even Western opera, I used to hate vocal music. I like only, only instrument, instrumental music. And now I love vocal. And, and again, even if it's in a foreign language, you know, I just listen for the musicality of it. And I think what transformed me was here in, uh, since I used to like only instrumentals, I loved, there was a Mantovani uh, sort of an elevator music person, but he had a version of uh, One Fine Day from the opera Modern Butterfly. And that music was so beautiful, especially the strings. I got to appreciate, once I learned to love that, I loved the, the vocal version even more. Yeah. No. You know, it gives us insight into communication. 
And insight into communication should give us insight into education. When we educate our young generation, we have to know how to connect ourselves with the young people. This is especially important in teaching of this a priori world, you know, this rational world. This is the great weakness of our educational system, to teach mathematics to our children. They have great difficulties to lift themselves into the new level of abstraction. It's very, very difficult to explain it. Most of our teachers don't know. They are one lesson ahead of the class. One lesson ahead in the textbook. Nobody notices. They are always well prepared, one lesson ahead. They miss entirely, you know, this mystery of communication. What proverbs can achieve, and what they achieve, that they are understood, how understood they are, really, you know, when people understand the proverb, but how deep they are touched, we don't know. So what seems to be self-evident that progress must be the means of ideal communication. Again, we don't know really what we are achieving. What, what, of them, what about the saying, those who know don't speak? Those if you don't know. speak, then you can't explain to anybody the meaning of the proverb. Yeah, exactly. I get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, this was my last word. From now on, I will shut up. <laughs> and amen. <laughs> so the mystery was just touched on, you know, on the surface. We did not solve anything. I can repeat, those who know, don't talk. <laughs> those who talk, don't. I try to speak in spite of that. I, I don't know how far I have succeeded. It is up to you. I hope you will give me a good evaluation. need to earn you, Brad. I depend on it. <laughs> My next contract depends on your value. <laughs> so thank you very much for your... Well, I've been told that this is really your last lecture, yes. but we never know. We're Eddie. hoping it won't be. <laughs> last ball, last ball. But I want to say on behalf of Ollie, thank you so much for all of you that you have done, given us all these years. And if this really is your last lecture, we hope we'll see you sitting out here and adding to our discussions at some point. Those who know don't talk. In spite of what I tried many times, you convinced me. So I, I compare it that I shoot from the rustic pistol, the last. Last one. So I said this was the last one. I never know. <laughs> so.